My name is Jesse Crawford. Uh, a number of you know me as Jean-Luc. I also write uh, over at computer.rip, which maybe some of you have seen, hopefully not too many of you. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of background, I'm here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My kind of, you know, academic background and some of my, my professional background is in security. Uh, to be completely honest, I kind of uh, uh, burned out on security and I now work in sort of uh, DevOps and operations for a healthcare uh, software company. But, you know, security is one of those things where once you kind of first start paying attention to security, it's hard to ever stop, right? It's kind of always on your mind. So I want to talk about the intersection of security and another area of technology that I'm really interested in. And that's what I'm going to broadly call PNT or position navigation and time technology. So things like GPS, uh, methods of determining where you are in space, where you're going, other characteristics of that kind. Uh, most PNT technologies, generally speaking, are radio uh, based. It's part of why I'm interested in them. You know, I love everything radio. Um, that's not strictly a requirement in certain niche fields. There are optical, ultrasonic, uh, even sonar uh, in like, uh, uh, um, what, what's the term I'm looking for? Deep sea oil drilling. Um, there's a number of other technologies that are used for PNT applications, but, but for the most part, it's radio systems. So I want to talk a bit about sort of some PNT technologies that are out there um, and kind of the security implications and concerns surrounding them, which I think you'll, you'll find, if I'm successful in convincing you, are really pretty severe. And I'm going to be focusing especially on aviation. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of those things is that uh, I fly airplanes as a hobby, so this is, you know, you just kind of get interested in, in how these kinds of things really work. Um, but another reason is because aviation has a very long history of radio navigation technology. A lot of it kind of ossified in the post-World War II period, um, and so there's some fairly old technologies that are still in use today. So aviation is just, it's a very interesting example case for these sorts of technologies because there's a, a variety of things in use that range from very basic uh, to fairly complex. And I started out with this, you know, screenshot of an article from Panda's, you know, marketing blog. There's been a lot, I think, you know, another reason this is an interesting topic is because there's been quite a bit of public attention directed at aviation security. When I say quite a bit, I mean just a tiny, tiny bit, right? But relatively in the world of security and even kind of like counterterrorism, I think it's something that gets more public attention than other things. And, and hopefully you'll see that much of that public concern is uh, justified. And apologies for the barking dog. It always starts when I start uh, dictating to a microphone. So oh, let's just get started with a little bit of an overview of the technologies we're going to talk about. I have broadly divided uh, radio navigation technology and aviation into two categories. This is kind of my thing. This isn't you know necessarily a, um, a taxonomy that you'll see elsewhere. But broadly, I would say there are space modulation technologies, and there are multilateration technologies. Uh, space modulation is not a term that we use very much um, because it's not a technology that we use very much. Some would argue about whether or not it's really modulation at all, but uh, it'll make more sense when we see some examples. The basic idea of space modulation is a radio signal that differs in its characteristics depending on the physical location of the receiver. So if we kind of squint and tilt our heads just right, we can view that as a radio signal, which is modulated based on uh, position in space. And that obviously has some useful properties for uh, radio navigation purposes. And then multilateration is more what we think about um, when we think about radio positioning. It's the use of time of flight measurements uh, in order to determine uh, a position. Broadly, I have referred to these technologies as PNT, or Position Navigation Time. Not all of these we'll see are, are truly PNT technologies, but especially in multilateration, there is a very close relationship between determination of time and determination of position. Generally, you need one to get the other. Something I want you to pay attention to as we look at these technologies is the difference between position and navigation specifically. Uh, what we're going to see is that some of these technologies give you position information. They tell you where you are. Some of these technologies give you navigation. 
information. They tell you which direction you're going, whether you're moving towards something or away from something. Uh, so it's, it's very kind of relative information. Um, there's some overlap between these, but most systems really do give you one or the other. Um, so GPS, for example, generally conveys position technology, but it really doesn't uh, convey navigation technology. So, you know, GPS tells you where you are, but it doesn't really tell you where you're going. Uh, with, with narrow exceptions, um, if I don't mention it, ask me about uh, something called a GPS compass, which is kind of a, uh, really, I think it's kind of a hilarious device that is often used on ships these days. So let's start out by talking about some of these space modulation technologies. Um, if you think about it, uh, if you really, you know, if you really, <laughs> if you really have a bit of the devil's lettuce and think about it, uh, then every radio signal is a space modulated radio signal, right? Because they come from somewhere and radio direction finding technologies exist that, you know, with, with many limitations, allow us to determine the origin of a radio signal, which conveys information about navigation. And this has been used in aviation. This goes back a very long ways. I don't know what the first use of, uh, of radio beacons was in aviation. I do know that um, early aviation navigation often relied on direction finding to commercial radio stations rather than dedicated navids. But it used to be that uh, aviation made use of something called an NDB. And an NDB is a non-directional beacon. Um, we've got a photo of, of an NDB uh, transmitter here. It's really just an antenna. It sends out a signal. That's all it does. On board the aircraft, you have uh, a direction-finding antenna array like this. And uh, based on historically a rotating antenna, a rotating directional antenna, and looking for nulls and peaks, uh, these days based on solid state, when I say these days, I mean like starting in the 70s, based on solid state technologies, uh, the NDB receiver determines the direction from the aircraft to the radio transmitter. And it depicts it on a little instrument that's, you know, got your little figural airplane and radio transmitter is that direction. And you can imagine this is useful. Like if there's an NDB at an airport, now you can fly towards the NDB in order to get to that airport. Um, NDBs have largely been phased out. Uh, NDB transmitters, they do still exist in the United States. Um, I think maybe tens, low tens of them, but on the whole, they're on the way out. Um, I have never personally seen an aircraft with an NDB receiver. I mean, I haven't personally seen that many aircraft, but the, the receivers are not super common these days either. Uh, most people have removed them, just kind of fitting the number of NDBs that have been removed. So let's look at something which is a little more sophisticated. And this is kind of our, our golden example of space modulation. Um, you know, people would argue about NDBs and even VOR, but everyone agrees that ILS is an example of space modulation. Um, ILS is the instrument landing system. So the basic idea of ILS is uh, we have an aircraft that somehow gets to, you know, roughly a correct approach for landing. We're kind of assuming it's bad weather or something and the, the pilots can't just see where they're going. So maybe a controller gives them radar vectors or they use another navigation technology to get to generally the right place. But now uh, they need pretty accurate guidance in order to actually get them you know, lined up with and down to the runway in a nice controlled approach. Uh, ILS uh, achieves this using two different transmitters, which use the same uh, modulation technique, really, uh, just in different bands and in different orientations. So to start off, we'll look at the example of the localizer. Uh, the purpose of the localizer is to tell you whether or not you are, you know, lined up with the extended center line of the runway. So basically, if you just keep flying straight forward, are you going to end up, uh, you know, lined up with and on the runway? Uh, or are you to the left or to the right? Uh, there is a transmitter located off the end of the runway. If you take a look at an airport, you can often see the rack that holds the antennas for this transmitter. Um, that broadcasts a signal, and importantly, it actually broadcasts two signals. Uh, they share the same carrier, but one is modulated at 90 hertz, the other is modulated at 150 hertz. Those two different modulated signals are transmitted by two sets of directional antennas, which are oriented slightly differently. One is aimed off to the right a little bit, one is aimed off to the left a little bit. So, which of these signals you receive most strongly will depend on where you are physically located. If you are right in the middle, lined up nicely, then you should receive equal proportions of the 90 hertz and the 150 hertz tone. If the 90 hertz tone is much stronger, 
then you kind of know that you're somewhere up here, maybe, and you need to correct left. Uh, in addition to the localizer, we have the glide slope transmitter, which gives you your vertical guidance, and the glide slope transmitter works the exact same way. It's just kind of rotated 90 degrees, so it's on the vertical axis instead of the horizontal. Uh, this is a pretty simple scheme. Uh, it was developed um, actually kind of during World War II, and it's still in widespread use today. This is still kind of considered the, the main way um, that precision approaches are performed at airports. So what are kind of some, you know, practical and security properties of the ILS? Well, ILS, it's generally viewed as being just kind of a touchy, sensitive thing. Um, you can see it's all analog. We're trying to judge the proportions of two received signals, which is obviously going to be variable on a number of factors. So there's a lot of kind of things that can screw it up. Uh, particularly older ILS receivers that were, were fully analog, were using tube technology, were manufactured before modern uh, understanding of RFI engineering, were, were known to have kind of a problem with receiving interference and with spurious behavior uh, due to radio frequency interference. It's generally, that's much less of an issue than it is today. Modern ILS receivers are, are digital. They're, they're built using modern standards um, for uh, interference rejection. But there still is, you know, kind of a perennial concern about just accidental uh, interference with ILS. Uh, complete spoofing, what I'm calling full authority spoofing uh, of ILS has been demonstrated. What I mean is some people threw together some software and a couple of SDRs. They pointed an antenna at an airplane and they were able to make the ILS instrument in the aircraft show whatever they wanted it to. Um, they kind of totally took control. Keep in mind that space modulation like ILS normally is dependent on the aircraft position relative to arrays of antennas, which are somewhat complex to install. But the only reason we need that complexity is because we want the system to work in the general case, as an aircraft, you know, moves through the area. If you're just trying to interfere with one aircraft, you can forget that whole thing. You can just use one antenna. It can even be omnidirectional if you're not trying to be discreet. All you have to do is transmit one signal, in practice two, one for the glide slope, one for the uh, localizer, which have, you know, whatever proportion of modulation is what you want the aircraft instrument to display. You really don't need to worry about all the space modulation stuff, so that makes it easier. Um, ILS might be a little tricky to exploit in practice because you generally need to transmit somewhere near the airport with more power than the actual ILS transmits, although that's not a lot. It's like five watts, I think. So, you know, there's obviously potential to do that. From a perspective of, you know, counterterrorism or, or security, ILS is a very vulnerable system. Um, ILS is used at a very critical phase of flight. It is often being used in instrument conditions where... The pilots have, you know, limited availability of other information sources on where they're located. So, you know, nominally, uh, obviously, pilot is going to reject the approach if they get too close to the ground without, you know, making visual contact with the runway. In practice, though, you can imagine, you know, if you can ILS an aircraft towards like a steep hill or mountain, uh, it becomes very unlikely that they would be able to recover uh, by the time they noticed that situation assuming that they weren't kind of checking uh, or cross-checking against other instruments. So th there's potentially a pretty serious potential for, for you know, a, a very uh, a mass fatality kind of uh, terrorism incident um, based on hijacking ILS. We'll talk a little more later on, too. Uh, when I say, you know, other information and cross-checking, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later on. But you know, generally speaking, there are a lot of aircraft out there, not so much commercial uh, airliners, but there are a lot of smaller aircraft out there that they don't really have any good way of cross-checking their ILS result. ILS is intended for use over a pretty short or a pretty small area. You know, it's basically for aircraft that are already kind of in the right place and they just need that sort of last mile um, or, you know, really last several miles uh, precision guidance to, to touch down on the runway in the right place. Um, there is a similar space modulation technology, though, that exists for larger area navigation. I'm going to try to not spend like a half hour just talking about this because there's a surprising number of complexities um, in kind of the details of this system. But very generally speaking, there is something called VOR, which stands for uh, VHF Omni Range or VHF Omnidirectional Range. Uh, 
the way VOR works is that there is a transmitter, or really there's a bunch of transmitters located on the ground in various places. Uh, this is a picture of one of those transmitters. You've probably seen these things before just driving around. They're kind of weird looking, so they sort of stand out when you see one with the, kind of the traffic cone on top, which to boot is sometimes painted traffic cone orange. Um, this, this device transmits a signal which is modulated in kind of an interesting way. Uh, there's an antenna in the center, which is called the reference antenna. It's probably kind of in the cone on this one. That transmits uh, a carrier with a sine wave. Um, omnidirectionally. Then kind of around the VOR is an array of antennas. Exactly how this is built varies. This photo depicts something called a, a Doppler VOR, we can tell, because it's got these kind of little antennas mounted um, around the, the kind of the base there. But there are other designs as well. There's also the conventional VOR, which is same same idea. It's just a little different transmitter design, and they are a little more compact and won't have um, those smaller antennas around them. But th the idea is that simultaneously with that reference signal from the center antenna, there is a effectively a ring of antennas which are transmitting a signal which contains a sine wave which is out of phase with the center reference signal to a different amount depending on which direction it's being transmitted. So let's work an example. This is a figure... Um, down here that comes from some FAA source. I think this is from an old version of the PHAC. Um, so we have an aircraft, and this aircraft's VOR receiver, uh, it receives the reference signal, and then it receives the modulated signal, and it determines that the reference signal and the modulated signal are out of phase with each other by 315 degrees, um, or rather that the modulated signal is delayed from the reference signal by 315 degrees. That measurement tells the pilot of this aircraft that they are located somewhere on the 315 degree radial from the VOR. Or another way to word that is that the heading, uh, magnetic heading, from the VOR to their aircraft is 315 degrees. Uh, this system is it's pretty useful. There's a reason it's been used for a long time. Um, it's very easy to fly either directly towards or directly away from a VOR because you just need to kind of figure out which radial you're on and then stay on it effectively. Um, you can also use it in more complex ways. You know, if you can receive two VORs, then you can plot those two radials on your chart and you can get uh, a somewhat accurate idea of your current location. So this is a kind of a powerful, flexible, and important system. And it's really kind of the direct descendant of NDBs and of something called the four course radio range or the low frequency uh, range, which were kind of precursor navigation technologies to VOR. Um, another little thing I want to add about VOR before I get uh, too far on, I'm not, I'm really trying to resist the urge to go deep into the DME and TACAN stuff, but it is kind of possible in some cases to determine not just the radial from the VOR, but also the distance. Uh, this requires that both the VOR and the aircraft be equipped with special equipment, um, something called DME or, or TACAN. Um, it's very common for VORs to be so equipped. Aircraft, uh, it just kind of depends. Bigger aircraft are more likely to have DME. Also, older aircraft are more likely to have DME if they were kind of outfitted before GPS was common. Um, but it, it's not standard. There's a lot, a lot of aircraft out there which only can determine which radial they're on. They cannot determine the distance. So sort of don't count on this as being a system that gives you a full location fix. Um, there is, and this is going to be a theme, there is no authentication involved in uh, the VOR system. Um, the, the military variant TACAN has some very limited authentication capabilities, um, but it, virtually no civilian aircraft have the equipment for that, so this is completely unauthenticated. Um, that said, I did some digging. I could not find an example of someone demonstrating spoofing uh, of VOR. Conceptually, it would not be very difficult. Um, I think actually one of the biggest reasons that no like security researcher or hobbyist has written up, here's how I did it, is just because uh, it would be difficult to test and demonstrate in the real world without producing an unsafe situation uh, because the range of, of VOR is, is relatively long compared to ILS. So there's, you know, I, <laughs> I want to try this out, but I would be reticent too, just because it's hard to sort of contain the, uh, the, the, radi the effect radius uh, of the interference that you're causing.
Um, totally possible to spoof and, uh, and to jam. It's a little more difficult because VORs transmit at relatively high power, um, but you absolutely could. And kind of a thing to know about VOR, and we're going to loop back to this later, is while not like an announced policy, the general perception is that VOR is on the way out. Um, generally, year over year, there are fewer VOR sites. Um, they're, they're decommissioning them faster than they're installing new ones. Uh, there's kind of a broad view that GPS has sort of obsoleted the VOR system, um, and over time we may see it uh, basically dying out. So that's that's pretty much the world of space modulation uh, in aviation. There's some other things as well. Uh, there's space modulation techniques, but they are not uh, in as common of use today. So I kind of want to move on to multilateration. And multilateration, we need to start with a little bit of history. So we're going to talk about something which is a little different from what we usually think of when we say, you know, multilateration-based PNT technology. And that is Loran C. Uh, Loran C, depending on, you know, how you how you kind of count it, you could say that Loran C was the first uh, civilian large area radio navigation technology deployed by the United States. Um, there were earlier things like transit. Uh, Loran itself was directly based on uh, technology developed by the United Kingdom, which was called G, and in fact, it turned into a lawsuit. Um, but, you know, obviously G was sort of specific to uh, Britain and the British Isles. Uh, Loran C, uh, or transit, I should say, was sort of specific to military use. Um, Loran C was sort of the first the first thing in the United States that was very much, you know, you can get a Loran C receiver, and then over a large area, you, you now know where you're located. Um, Loran was originally designed as a maritime navigation aid, uh, and it was largely used that way. There were aircraft with Loran receivers, but that was not especially common. Uh, mostly this was a maritime technology, so it was operated, it was installed and operated by the Coast Guard, uh, and sort of the necessities of the system led to funny things, like uh, I have a, a nice team photo here from before it shut down of Coast Guard Station Las Cruces. Uh, this is Coast Guard Station Las Cruces here. Uh, it was a, a Loran transmitter site located just a little ways out of uh, Las Cruces. Is that the, the furthest Coast Guard Station from water? Um, <laughs> probably not. I, I bet you can find one in Colorado somewhere, but it certainly is kind of funny. So Loran C is an example of something that's called a hyperbolic uh, navigation technology, and we kind of have to talk a little bit about the idea of multilateration to understand that. The basic concept of multilateration is that if you can determine how far you are from two points, then you can kind of figure out where you are um, based on time of flight. And distance in this context and time are intimately connected because we're basically talking about radio signals. They propagate at the speed of light in the atmosphere or whatever. Um, so you're kind of counting the milliseconds it takes a radio signal to get from a reference station to you. You can compute a distance from that. If you can do this with more than one reference station, you can start to narrow down your location. Um, this is all well and good. The problem is you receive a radio signal. How do you know when it was transmitted? Uh, a modern solution to that might involve highly accurate reference clocks, but when Loran was designed, that was not really practical. It's, it's still not really practical today when you get down to it. So hyperbolic navigation systems used sort of a, a, a technique that I'm calling relative time of, of arrival. So the idea is something like this. You have two stations which are uh, make up what's called a baseline, which is sort of the imaginary plane between the two stations. I cannot draw. Uh, I hope you uh, understand that's supposed to be a straight line. Um, if you're located, like, up here, then Station A transmits a, si transmits a signal. That signal arrives uh, to you in A milliseconds. Uh, you don't know, you receive the signal, but you don't know what that time is, because you don't know how far away you are from Station A. That same signal from Station A, though, is received by Station B. When Station B receives the signal, it waits a fixed period of time, let's call it 5 milliseconds, and then it repeats it again. So a little bit later, you receive a second radio signal. We'll call that uh, B milliseconds from an unknown start point. And you now know the difference in time of arrival between A and B. You know that difference in time. 
you also know because it's you know programmed into your receiver or laid out on your charts what the distance is between A and B, and you know what fixed delay B waits before transmitting. Uh, if you kind of work out the arithmetic on this, given knowledge of the difference in the two reception times, the difference in the two transmit times, given the distance and the fixed delay, you can kind of do the arithmetic and you can establish that you must be located on a certain arc relative to those two stations. It's actually a hyperbola, which is why we call it hyperbolic navigation. Doesn't that make sense? Um, so you now know that you're located somewhere on the arc. If you can get a second baseline, which often two baselines would share a station, so that might be like here, and that's, you know, station C, then you can work out a second arc that you must be on. And now you have an intersection, and that intersection is where you are. In practice, there are actually two intersections, but they're usually very, very far away from each other, so it's pretty easy to look at your chart and say, you know, there's no way we got that far overnight, so it must be, you know, it should be fairly obvious which fix is the correct one. Um, Loran C worked pretty well. It was fairly precise. Um, it worked much better over water because of the lack of, uh, of obstacles, but it was a high-frequency system, so it had fairly good propagation characteristics over land. This might raise the question, what happened to uh, Loran? Well, basically, GPS replaced it. Um, you know, the Air Force launched GPS primarily for military use, but it turned into basically a funding situation. Uh, once GPS became fully available, it became very difficult for the Coast Guard to kind of defend the funding that was required to maintain the Loran system. And so in the late 2000s, uh, Loran was fully decommissioned and uh, is no longer available for use at all. So let's move on from Loran to more what we think of today when we talk about multilateration-based uh, PMT. And that is GNSS. GNSS stands for Global uh, Navigation Satellite System, and it's just sort of a generic term to encompass the fact that GPS is not the only um, GNSS, although certainly people often say GPS when they mean generically all GNSS. Uh, the basic idea is somewhat similar to Loran, except for we get rid of the relative time of arrival concept, and we, we instead go for accurate time synchronization and then an absolute time of arrival. So we have one or more satellites uh, you can see in this figure. Each of these satellites contains a highly accurate reference clock, which is further disciplined from ground stations to maintain extremely precise time on the satellites. I believe current generation GPS satellites have a set of four redundant hydrogen masers on board, uh, and they use a voting process um, to determine a, a highly precise time, uh, even with the failure of one or more of those reference clocks. So the satellites know what time it is very precisely. Then we have a receiver somewhere on the ground. The satellites are continuously transmitting a timestamp. The receiver gets a set of multiple timestamps, which come from multiple satellites. The receiver can now do a somewhat complex process of bootstrapping in order to determine we have these times, you know, there's a certain delay in our reception, uh, which is based on the distance. And with basically sort of an extended guess and check process, we can actually determine uh, both the time on the satellites and our location. Generally speaking, you know, and sort of in theory, you need one to know the other. You need to know the time to get your position, or you need to know your position to get the time. But by basically doing guess and check refinement on both our position and time fixes, uh, a GPS receiver can figure out a very precise position on the ground. Now, in practice, that often takes 10 to 15 minutes, but you'll notice that your phone doesn't take 10 to 15 minutes in order to determine a GPS location. And that is because most modern GPS receivers flagrantly cheat um, I won't go into a lot of depth on how that works, but there's a lot of simplifications and assumptions and uh, kind of out-of-band information that goes into modern GPS receivers being able to get a fix very quickly uh, instead of having to sit for a while um, before they, they sort of settle. But, you know, that, that has a precision impact, and you'll still see that, like, land surveyors will put down a GPS receiver and they'll leave it there for 48 hours and then do... Um, out-of-band fix uh, calculation because that gets them kind of the most precise possible result. I threw in this figure too. This depicts Beidou. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that uh, these GPS satellites are all moving. There's all sorts of different uh, kind of orbital uh, parameters that can be used for GNSS satellites. 
Um, it depends on the system, what the design is, but as a general rule, a lot of GNSS systems tend to be more uh, useful towards the equator and less useful towards the poles, uh, just as a practical result of uh, the way that they're deployed, because obviously there's a lot of population near the equator and not so much population near the poles. I say there's several GNSS systems. What am I talking about? Well, th there's there's probably, there's at least six. Uh, I, I reckon if you count them all up, you probably get closer to 10. But there's four major global uh, GNSS. Um, the oldest is GPS, uh, launched by the United States. Not long after, uh, Russia launched GLONASS. Um, a little while after that, China started putting up their own system, which is called Beidou, although it's occasionally also referred to by other names. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. And then fairly recently, the European Union started work on their own system, which is called Galileo. All of these uh, systems, you know, are fundamentally based on the same principles, but there are some differences between them. Uh, first, w what's common um, besides the basic operating method? All four of these systems uh, are known or believed to provide some degree of dual precision. Typically, and in the case of GPS, GLONASS, and Beidou, what we mean by dual precision is that there is a low precision feed, which is available to the public, and a high precision feed, which is available only to the military, which is intended more for use in targeting weapons. Um, that said, uh, there are exceptions to that. Uh, one of those is that the GLONASS high precision feed uh, was never especially well protected in the first place, and the encryption keys have since been disclosed. So the GLONASS uh, high precision feed is now fully available to the public. Another funky exception is Galileo. The high-precision Galileo feed is not actually reserved for military use. It's reserved for use by paid licensees. So you can just cough up some money for a more precise Galileo result. Another consideration uh, with these is something called selective availability. Uh, selective availability basically means that the public uh, feed can be shut down in the event of a military conflict in order to deprive the enemy of use of uh, you know, your GNSS. That was viewed as very important when these systems were first designed and launched, but in practice, uh, the importance of selective availability is kind of decreased because, you know, look at it from a U.S. perspective. Both Russia and China now have their own GNSS, so does depriving them of the use of GPS really achieve that much uh, in contrast to the disruption it causes? So the selective availability capability of GPS uh, is basically officially deprecated. Um, GLONASS, I think it's possible that similar has happened. Beidou, it has not really been disclosed what the selective availability plan is there. A final thing I want to note looking at these four GNSS is that people have a tendency to take GNSS for granted, more than they probably should. Uh, GLONASS, by the late 90s, had essentially started falling apart. There were areas of the world where you can no longer get a GLONASS fix. The precision of GLONASS fixes was uh, appreciably compromised globally, uh, and that was simply because satellites were failing and not being replaced. Uh, in the early 2000s, something that was actually kind of a real big uh, political achievement for Putin was a, a complete refurbishment of GLONASS. They basically replaced the whole constellation, and it's now back and better than it was before. Uh, GPS, you know, we might think this is the kind of problem that Russia has, right? Very similar story with GPS, actually. In the late 2000s, I think it was in 2009, the GAO put out a report where they said GPS was at risk of the exact same thing happening. Satellites were failing at a higher rate than they were being replaced just due to the funding level of the program. Uh, and we were looking at a real possibility that GPS performance would start degrading due to underfunding. Um, that resulted in a major replenishment or refurbishment project that is underway right now. It's costing billions of dollars. Progress is slow, but, you know, what can I say? It is defense contracting. So this is an interesting figure. What this shows is the bands, you know, the frequencies, basically, that are used by these different uh, GNSS systems. Specifically, this shows us three GPS, Galileo, and Compass. Uh, know that Compass here is actually a different name for, G, uh, for Beidou, the Chinese system. Notice that there is substantial overlap. And even where there isn't overlap, many of these frequencies are relatively close together. That means that in practice, jamming one of these systems, if it's not done very carefully, will tend to jam the others as well. Um, that's one of the reasons that we've seen so much testing of GPS jamming by the military, because you have to be 
kind of it, it's kind of a touchy thing. You have to be very careful about filtering your output signal to not interfere with all of these systems. So when we just look at jamming uh, resistance for GNSS, there's a degree to which it's kind of all or nothing. Um, relying on multiple GNSS is not actually that likely to save you from a jamming scenario. A little bit of complexity that I want to add on when we talk about GNSS2 is something called differential GNSS. The basic idea here is that with modern GNSS receivers, the dominant source of error in the GNSS fix is actually orbital perturbation of the satellites. So getting a, getting a fix to converge means that you have to know where the satellites are located, and that is accurately measured by ground stations, but in practice, the satellites <clears throat> do vary slightly from their calculated orbital ephemera, and that can end up, you know, integrating into a fairly substantial error. When I say fairly substantial error, I mean on the order of meters, uh, even tens of meters, uh, in the locations that are determined by receivers. The cool thing is that orbital perturbation is pretty consistent. Like, these satellites aren't bouncing around all over the place. When they're a little bit off their calculated orbit, they tend to stay that way, and that error tends to affect a whole region. So that brings us to the idea of differential GNSS, which is basically we have a reference station. That reference station has a location, which has been precisely determined using like uh, conventional surveying methods. And that reference station is equipped with a GNSS receiver, which it uses to compute a GNSS fix. There will be a certain amount of error in that fix, dominantly due to these orbital perturbations. Whatever that error is, is likely consistent throughout the region. So the reference station takes the difference between its computed fix and its known accurate location, and it actually distributes that error information. Now, other receivers, which are located in the same general area, just apply the same correction, which should basically cancel out that orbital perturbation error and result in a more accurate fix. Historically, there have been different uh, differential systems. The first we had in the United States was called DGPS for differential GPS that was operated by the Coast Guard predominantly for maritime use. Uh, and it was based on, I believe, VHF uh, transmissions of error from the reference stations. The FAA stepped in, though, to develop uh, a differential GPS system, which would be a little more amenable to aviation use. They called that WAS, or the Wide Area Augmentation System, and uh, WAS, it's very much like differential GPS, but with the important difference that WAS stations actually send their correction data to a data center, which sends it to a ground station, which actually sends it back up to a satellite, and WAS corrections get transmitted in the same band as your other GPS information. That has the convenient result that it is pretty inexpensive to add WAS correction to a GPS receiver, um, so in practice, actually, you'd be surprised how many GPS receivers uh, use WAS. Like, I have a, a Garmin hiking uh, GPS device that, that actually applies WAS corrections because it's just not that hard for it to do. Um, it was determined that it was a little silly for the U.S. government to operate two different uh, differential systems, so DGPS has been shut down, and WAS is now preferred for maritime use as well. Um one of the main reasons that WAS is used is because of uh, basically radio navigation landing approaches, which are based on GPS. The The whole like details of the regulations here get kind of complicated. I don't have my instrument rating, so I don't remember all of them. Uh, but generally speaking, in certain conditions, it is permissible to perform an instrument landing, meaning you can't see out the windows, basically, um, using only GPS without ILS available. Um, there's somewhat more generous kind of safety margin requirements when you're doing that, but there is also a set of requirements that apply to your onboard GPS receiver, and one of those is that it must apply WAS corrections. Um, so you must have that, you know, that little extra bump in accuracy if you're going to be using GPS data for the purposes of an instrument landing approach. Uh, we'll talk a, another a, a little bit um, about a different one of those special requirements for landing approach in a minute. So uh, some general properties of GNSS. Number one, GPS spoofing, 100% um, a thing. It is actively being used. Um, this is a, a real military problem right now at this moment. With the exception of Galileo, none of these systems provide any authentication on their publicly available feeds, and often the authentication on the military feed is a little bit questionable. 
So, you know, Galileo is not widely deployed yet. It will be a little bit of a save here, but for the most part, all of these GNSS, uh, GNSS systems are vulnerable to spoofing. Jamming of GNSS is also a big deal. In practice, these signals that are being received from the satellites, they're very weak. Um, so it's easy to jam them, and jamming, as I mentioned, often affects all of these systems rather than just one. What's kind of the scope of the concern? Um, well, the, the U.S. military has been performing a number of experiments with GPS jamming, and there's been some pretty concerning results that's come out of that. And the big one uh, is right here in this uh, FAA telegraphic message. The short explanation is that as a direct result of a military GPS jamming exercise, it was discovered that a specific set of regional jets manufactured by Embraer, these are people often call these ERJs, Embraer Regional Jets, um, had a problem with their avionics. Um, this is, you know, a combination of, I think, some unintended consequences and a bug where loss of GPS information resulting from, for example, jamming or maybe even just an equipment failure, uh, if it occurred twice because they have redundant uh, GPS radios, kicked off a, a chain of events which resulted in the yaw damper becoming non-functional as well as some other aids uh, to the pilot in controlling the aircraft. Um, without going too much into the, you know, the kind of the flight dynamics, um, the result of the yaw damper becoming non-functional, uh, as well as failure of some of your other aids, is that it becomes very easy for the aircraft to enter a situation called a Dutch roll, where it's sort of swerving back and forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, a severe Dutch roll at high airspeeds can become a very dangerous situation. So we have sort of this unexpected situation here where the loss of GPS information, which you would tend to think all that should really mean is you don't get like your GPS chart plotter working anymore, actually leads directly to uh, difficulty in the basic control of the aircraft um, because of the design of the avionics. Certainly, this is not the kind of thing that should happen. Uh, I also mentioned that spoofing uh, of GNSS is a very real problem. I just wanted to mention some examples. By far the biggest, it goes back 10 years now, uh, Iran captured an RQ-170, uh, I believe that is the Sentinel um, unmanned aerial system. Uh, basically, as far as the public understands, through GPS spoofing, um, it lost its control feed. It went into a fallback behavior, uh, which was basically to fly home. But by GPS spoofing, they got it confused about where home was so that this aircraft just, you know, nicely landed under its own power in Iran uh, and was captured that way. Um, but we're not limited to that. You know, uh, both Russia and China have been observed uh, spoofing GPS in multiple situations, including during a NATO exercise when it was really a, a pretty bold thing to be doing. So let's sort of sum up this whole discussion. Uh, kind of the bottom line, radio navigation is not super reliable from a security perspective. Uh, Galileo is almost the only system which provides any strong authentication. Uh the vast majority of radio navigation applications out there right now, including aviation, have no fundamental protection uh, against spoofing. So I think this is something we should all be kind of uh, nervous about. You can reduce the risk by having the ability to uh, cross-reference between multiple technologies. You know, spoofing one thing is, is, in some cases, already hard. Spoofing two things is quite a bit harder, right? So if we have multiple redundant uh, location methods, that gives us a way to detect interference, to detect and resist interference with any one of them. Unfortunately, this is not necessarily something which is widely uh, deployed. And a really big point is that there's a widespread feeling that the GNSS, like GPS, have basically uh, obsoleted other radio navigation technologies, and so those other radio navigation technologies are starting to slip out of use. So how do we improve? You know, what should we be doing? Well, number one, uh, all equipment should be thoroughly tested for what happens when there is interference with radio navigation capability. You know, we might have avoided that problem with the Embraer, which led to the FAA um, putting out an airworthiness directive that they should not be operated during GPS jamming exercises by just thoroughly testing the behavior of all of this equipment when GNSS information is lost. Um, we can mitigate uh, the impacts of spoofing by having a correlation of different independent methods of location. 
And I mentioned that, you know, there's special requirements for aircraft that are going to be making landing approaches based on GPS. One of those is that they have to make use of a technology called Receive Autonomous Integrity Monitoring, or RAIM. And the basic idea of RAIM is that you have multiple independent GPS receivers, which compute multiple independent fixes in which they rule out different single GPS satellites. Uh, if there is substantial disagreement between any of these independently determined fixes, then you get a warning, uh, basically, that indicates a loss of GPS information. So this is uh, basically intended as a method of detecting faults, but it also has some uh, upside in that it makes it more likely that spoofing will be detected. Basically, if someone is spoofing um, a GPS signal, but you're still successfully receiving fixes from real satellites in some cases, then Ray might detect the inconsistency in the fixes determined using different subsets of satellites uh, and alert the pilot that something is going wrong. Another method to detect interference is fusing your radio navigation data with inertial navigation data. So inertial navigation, which is basically dead reckoning, you know, like we use accelerometers to determine how we're accelerating, which we can then integrate to determine how we are moving. Uh, inertial navigation technology is getting better and better. You know, there's crazy methods these days that are like, uh, um, what are they called? There are, I think they're called laser ring gyroscopes, which are extremely precise accelerometers. Uh, these inertial measurement methods have been used in weapons for quite some time. Uh, and a lot of uh, like commercial airliners are also equipped with inertial navigation equipment. Um, so this gives us a big opportunity for error detection, basically. Um, we should get roughly similar results from our inertial navigation and our radio navigation, and if they disagree, that is a big red flag uh, that something is going on. Um, it's very obvious that we should have authentication of radio navigation technology. I mean, I think that's obvious to everyone today, but it's really hard to go back and fix these because we have a lot of deployed equipment, which often is in space. We have a lot of deployed receivers and all kinds of consumer devices. You know, it's kind of the, the, the ship has sailed on authentication of things like GPS. So hopefully Galileo is kind of our hope going forward uh, of an authenticated GNSS. And finally, and this is one of my, you know, if I have like a big political lobby that I'm making from this uh, talk, it's the diversity of radio navigation methods is very important. Uh, the view that GPS exists and is good so we can get rid of our other radio navigation methods, that's kind of fundamentally going down a very bad path. There's a lot of reasons to worry about GPS. You know, if you're not worried about spoofing, worry about anti-satellite warfare. Um, it's a very good idea to have other methods available um, to determine our position and to cross-check different position methods. Uh, Jim Platt, who was, uh, I think, a director of CISA, you know, has this quote about, basically, GPS can be jammed or spoofed, so we should never rely on it too hard, right? Um, well, here's the problem. Uh, we do. We very widely rely on the efficacy of, efficacy of GPS, and in more places than you would ever imagine. Because we have this PNT triad, because position is closely connected to time, GPS is widely used not only as a source of position information, but also as a source of time information, and that gets you crazy results, like loss of GPS could result in a lot of telecommunications infrastructure malfunctioning, because a lot of uh, TDMA-based uh, radio telecommunications technology relies on GPS as a time reference for the time division. Um, so it, there's kind of a way in which the whole world economy is sort of deeply dependent on the reliability of GPS, and that raises a lot of very uncomfortable questions about what would happen if there was an intentional or unintentional failure of GPS, especially over a wide area. There is some work going on um, in ways to kind of mitigate these risks. This is like a long paragraph from uh, an abstract of a paper, but the fundamental point here is that there's some researchers who are working with autonomous vehicles. Basically, I mentioned you can compare radio navigation and inertial navigation. That's kind of what they're doing. Um, they're collecting data from the vehicle in order to do dead reckoning, basically. So they're doing like, which way are the wheels pointed? How fast are the axles rotating? You can kind of work out how the vehicle's moving and thus its position that way and they're detecting any substantial disagreement between, you know, the way the vehicle is moving based on inputs and the computed GPS location. So this is a, a really great method to start addressing some of these. Uh, and I, I really hope, especially with things like autonomous vehicles becoming maybe an increasingly important part of the landscape, you know, we're starting to see um, they're testing autonomous semi-trucks in Albuquerque now. 
Uh, I really hope that people will look seriously at methods of being robust, very robust, against interference of GNSS, and that's going beyond just last-ditch methods of, you know, using LIDAR to try not to hit things. I want to bring back Loran again. This is a, a favorite pet topic of mine. But for uh, literally 20 years now, there have been perennial proposals to roll out a system called Enhanced or Electronic Loran, which is basically uh, Loran upgraded from all analog equipment to all digital electronic uh, electronics. There's a lot of potential. You don't need that many eLoran ground stations uh, to provide coverage of a very large portion of the United States, both on land and at sea. And because aircraft are up in the air and have much better line of sight, uh, you have you can get excellent coverage uh, for aviation purposes without too much difficulty. And it's not even that expensive. It's just, it's been really hard for anyone to ever get funding for eLoran because it's competing effectively against GPS. And, and lots of people, you know, in Congress look at this problem and they say, well, we've already solved it. You know, we have GPS available and they just don't want to roll out a second thing. I don't think that there is a, a sufficient popular perception of the fact that GPS and really any of these technologies is vulnerable and redundancy uh, just makes sense. The last thing I want to bring up are something called local positioning technologies. Once again, I won't go into depth on these because this is easily an hour on its own, but it's not that difficult to deploy your own radio navigation system that covers a small area. Uh, and you can use that as well as a redundancy method for GPS. This small area, I'll notice the local and LPS does not need to be that small. Um, the military is currently conducting trials with an LPS system made by a company called Locata. They're covering a large portion of the White Sands missile range uh, with the Locata system, and they're experimenting with using the Locata technology as redundancy for GNSS uh, for weapons targeting and aviation purposes. So this is a promising direction. Um, there's kind of lots of terrestrial ways that we can do navigation. LPS are one of them. And I do think it's super important when we talk about redundancy uh, to consider terrestrial as well as satellite. There's two reasons for that. Number one, as we've seen, most of the GNSS, most of the satellite-based systems operate in very similar bands. So jamming one tends to affect all. Number two, uh, in the world of the 21st century, anti-satellite warfare is becoming a bigger and bigger concern. There's a lot of people who think that if there were a full-scale military, you know, world military conflict at this point, one of the first things that would happen is that everyone would be shooting down everyone else's uh, GNSS satellites. Um, terrestrial systems are, are can be appreciably hardened uh, against attack compared to satellite systems. So that's a big motivation that, that you know, is under discussion at the Pentagon right now to deploy terrestrial rather than satellite-based systems. So uh, that was kind of a grab bag of information in a lot of ways, but I hope I put that together into something interesting for you. Uh, the big thing that I really want you to keep in mind is just push for redundancy. You know, whether you're like a policymaker, uh, and you know, if you are, please tell me, but <laughs> or you're just an engineer who's working on things that rely on PNT information, think very seriously, how are we resistant? How are we tolerant to intentional or unintentional uh, interference with any of these positioning systems? Uh, it just, it, it really, it is not safe to rely solely on like GPS for location information when we're talking about large moving objects where we have life safety concerns. Uh, we always need to be thinking, what is our fallback? How do we, you know, get a second opinion on our location information?